uh, uh, before I ever did a Rodeo mixtape, I did scratching on vinyl for a guy named, for a producer named Sir Jinx, a rapper named Dazzy D, and, and uh, the record label was called Thin Line Records. And this was the first vinyl ever sold from the record label of VIP Records. This is before Snoop, before uh, Nate Dogg, before Warren G. I, I, I did uh, uh, scratching on that record. So Steve heard it, and he said, hey, man, maybe you could do some mixed tapes for me. And I said, I would love to. He said, Dr. Dre is busy doing these records now, the Easy e the NWA, the Michelet, the DOC, the Above the Law stuff. He said, uh, um, you know, are you interested? And I said, yeah. He said, I'm going to take it to their studio, and we're going to let them know. I said, okay, cool. So we went to the, uh, the city out here, not too far from me, and the studio's still there, well, at least the building. It's called Audio Achievements uh, in the city of Torrance. They call it Old Torrance. So I went there, and Dre goes, yeah, man, go ahead and take over because I, I, I'm going to be too busy, you know, you know, doing this stuff, doing these albums. He said, but we'll still rap on them. So I started doing them, and the first tape I did was when Supersonic first came out. And uh, uh, Dre rapped on them, you know, J.J. Fad rapped on them. That one was called Breakdown. That was in 1987. And eventually we did another one called Recop. And then we just kept doing them, doing them bi-monthly. Dre would come to my house. Easy would come to my house. Cube would come to my house. But people always ask me, how was it working with those guys? You have to understand that N.W.A. had not taken off yet. Their albums didn't come out to mid-88. Yes, they didn't come out to mid-88. So I'm doing mixtapes from 87 to mid-88. So I'm doing mixtapes for almost a year now. And the only thing that was about was drop, that was dropped at that time was Boys in the Hood, and that was after Supersonic. And, and, and I'll tell you, uh, even though you know, they weren't to the magnitude they are now, those guys were real professionals, even at a young age. I will say that about them, you know. And me being from the streets and hearing some street shit, I knew that this was something that the world had never heard of. I didn't know it was going to blow up all over the world, but I, I knew it would blow up in my neighborhood, in Compton, Inglewood, South Central, Hollywood. But I didn't know. I don't think they even knew how big this was going to take off, bro. Because I remember yeah. asking Dre, I remember asking Dre, did you know it was going to take off the way it did? And he said, no. He said, but I knew controversy sells. So we went controversial with it. And Dre was a very, very smart dude, even back then when he was just doing mixed tapes. You know, very smart dude. He knew the business already, man. You know, he, he would, I like to say, 10 steps ahead of everyone, and every time I went to Sir Jinx's house when he was there, I never saw Dre just, you know, sitting around eating a bag of chips watching TV. He was always on the phone. He was always on a drum machine. He was always going places. He was always making moves. So that's one thing I could say about them. Easy E was the same way. Easy E was always on the phone. Was always showing people his music, his demos, and uh, and I'm gonna tell you where they got their positive feedback from. It was at the Rhodium Swamp Meet. I was there when Steve played three songs, and Jure was there. And uh, he played uh, L.A. is the Place. He didn't get that much of a response. He played a Fat Girl on My Jock. The response was no good. But when he played Boys in the Hood, that was it, man. That's when Steve told Dre, this is your ticket right here. And they were trying to push L.A. is the Place that Fat Girl on My Jock. They were still undecided. And when they saw the response that they were getting from Easy es voice, from the cutting and scratching on the choruses, those cutting and scratching that you hear on 8-Ball, you hear on Gangster Gangster, you hear on Boys in the Hood, that's all Rodeo Swamp Meat stuff. He incorporated what he did at the Rodium on those records. So, so Boys in the Hood had him going nuts then. Like like the crowd, yes. like, what was your reaction when you heard it? Like, was you tripping? Okay, he, here's my honest response. And, and my, me and my brother was there. My brother was there, 
And he said, damn, his voice, it's so different, it's dope. To me, I'll be, I really didn't like his voice. I thought it was too different. But when I heard the beat and I heard the scratching, so we liked it for different reasons. And and I'll yeah. tell you, man, it, it was just very, very different. It was just on some street shit we had never heard. Before that, to me, the best street song I ever heard was The Message by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. And I compared it to that, mm. but on some L.A. street shit, bro. Well, like you, know, you, did, I, you, you had six in the morning, and then uh, School of D's PSK. But those, yes, um, those were nothing and they were like dope. Boys in the Hood. Right, yeah. right, right. I mean, and those were dope. Those were some of my favorite songs. But I mean, and and don't don't get me wrong, bro. Dr. Dre was influenced by not only PSK, not only I, was Ice T, you know, uh, influenced by uh, School of D, but Dre loved East Coast music. East Coast music, because if you remember Easy e even would, would call themselves hip-hop, you know, uh, on some of their songs. And and uh, a lot of their beats were sampled from a lot of East Coast artists. You know, I'll even take a little step further. East Coast artists loved Dre's production. I was there in the studio with Steve Yano when EPMD went there and Chuck D went there and wanted Dre to produce some of their songs. So, East Coast was definitely influenced wow, by this, Grace Productions. Wow, this was what, 88, 89? I want to say 89, the latest 89. They wanted Dre to produce some of their tracks. Madonna, Michael Jackson, these are untold stories a lot of people don't know, wanted Dre to produce tracks for them. And let me tell you why Dre didn't. Not only because he was signed exclusive to Easy. But he had so many projects already here that he couldn't. He didn't have the time. There was only one goose that laid the golden eggs, bro. And and he couldn't. He just had so many projects going on. So, 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 and, 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 so yeah, he probably was exclusive. Uh, but, I mean, can you imagine if he had went to Madonna, Michael Jackson route? Um, yeah. You know, he probably would have been on uh, Michael Jackson's. What, uh, what would that have been of uh, the eighty, of the ninety-one album? I forget what it was, but yeah, yeah maybe it was the bad. Yeah, but, yeah uh, Madonna it, too. Madonna wanted Dr. Dre. Yes, 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 bro. I can keep going down the list, and, and you know, rest in peace, Steve Yano. If he was still alive, he would even be able to tell you more stories, and I'll tell you why, because he filmed all that stuff. He literally yeah. filmed it. If anybody wants to see, or maybe have have seen. The Defiant Ones, all that old school footage was Steve Yano's. Well, Easy E rapping in the studio, you know, uh, Dr. Dre in the studio. And there's even a tiny, tiny clip. Yes, there's even a tiny, tiny clip where they actually show Steve Yano sitting at the board with Dr. Dre, you know. So, yeah, man. And, uh, I mean, the mixtapes even made the Defiant Ones. That's a part of Dr. Dre's history. 